So when I first started in security and open source, um, when I go on security Twitter or Kubernetes open source, there's often this mention of geese and honking. And for a long time, I didn't understand what it means, and there was never a good time to ask. Thankfully, there are two great talks out there um, that I linked at the end um, that explain this greatly. But the lore is that the goose is based after uh, this game called the Untitled Goose Game. And in the games, um, this, this goose go around and chain everyday object um, to wreak havoc on this village. And that idea of using everyday object um, to exploit and explore really resonated with the security community. Um, and over time, the goose has became this silly, goofy thing that uh, the community used to come together to learn and talk about complex topic like cloud native, like security supply chain. So what is security supply chain? So that are security issues that are produced by third party components and technologies. So anything that has to do with your dependencies or your um, build configuration. So because our uh, development cycle is faster today than it's ever been, we've seen a sharp rise in supply chain attacks over the past three years. Um, and in May 2021, the Biden administration released an executive order 14028 that outlines that um, any supplier that sells to the government must adhere by certain guidelines, and that means having SBOM, that means having certain assistation. And this creates a ripples effect, right? Because suppliers to the government will now ask their suppliers to add a station. But on a wider scale, it's good for uh, us and, and, uh, as an industry to have a conversation about this. And so you're probably not new to like Lock4J, solar wind attacks, and stuff like that. Before we go into it though, a little bit about me. Um, I still go to school, fortunately or unfortunately, it depends on who you're talking to. Um, and as part of my degree, I'm required to do six internships. And that what that makes me is a professional intern. I need to onboard and create value really quickly. Um, over the past two years, I've worked on the Kubernetes release team. Um, uh, I will be leading 1.28 release, which is incredibly exciting. Um, I also work in SIG security uh, self-assessment. Um, but all of this doesn't make me an expert. Not at all. Um, this talk is a result of two things. Number one, me being stuck in Palo Alto with two friends and zero ability to drive. Um, number two, this talk is the result of a great and welcoming community of folks um, who were so kind to me when I asked question. And my goal for this talk is I will tell you what I've learned so far along the way. So our agenda today is like this. We've covered the intro. Um, my goal for you to leave this room and establish a foundation and familiarity to software supply chain security. And it's a hard subject. It's scary, gave me goosebumps. Um, so, because you're attending a talk by a Gen Z, uh, I was born after 9-11, if that puts things into perspective, um, I'm going to ask you to do something kind of scary. We're going to manifest together. Um, we're going to do this once. We're going to do this great. I have so much faith in the people in this room. I excel at new hard things. Let's hear it. So good. Okay. Right in set, framework. Um, we're gonna talk about salsa today because as an industry, we need language, common language to talk about best practices and standard. But before we can do that, we need to learn a few keywords. Um, so if we were friends, which we are now, by the way, and I bitch you a cake, you probably eat it. Um, but if someone walks up to you on the street and be like, here, please eat this cake, I think you pass on it. And that is because you know me and you know that I bake the cake. And assistation is almost the same way. It's a sign claim of things. So this can be claims on your network configuration, claims on your dependency, um, claims on your building infrastructure. Um, in the context of salsa, which we're gonna talk about in a second, um, an assistation takes a more specific step. It needs an envelope, it needs predicate. But to simplify, just think of it as sign claims and now you have provenance. Um, so literally provenance means origin. What went into making your materials into artifacts um, that you release? And then lastly, we have software builds of material. Um, so basically this is about your dependency, um, but more specifically, like what does your software looks like? Um, so my biggest um, 
misunderstanding when I first approached the topic was I thought these exist um, in isolation, and that's not true because you can have an attested S bomb uh, or your attestation can refer to uh, your S bomb, or a providence is a form of S bomb. Salsa. So Salsa is a security framework. And when I say framework, I want you to think of like strategic framework and not Node.js is a JavaScript framework framework. Um, essentially, it's a checklist uh, of things that you can do in order um, to protect your software and your built uh, infrastructure. And how it works is you have four levels. So you have, if, if you know nothing about Salsa, you start at zero. Um, number one is actually not that hard to uh, obtain. You need documentation of your build process. Um, you need that your build process is scripted. Uh, you need an unsigned provenance. Um, and similarly, as we go through the levels, uh, you, get, you have to do more and more things that secure your project. Um, so what Salsa does is it maps up um, the build process from developer, to all the way to consumer and the weak points along the way, and it offers you solution things you can do to mitigate these attacks. So we'll look at two today, but there's more on the Salsa website you can look at. So the first one is the Linux hypocrite commits. Um, so what happened in this scenario was that a university research team submitted malicious code to the Linux kernel. And so one way that Salsa offers help this is that on Salsa level four, um, you need two reviewer um, in order to get code to merge. Um, another one that we've heard lots about is SolarWind. Um, and now we know that SolarWind happened because of a compromise in the build process. What Salsa recommends along the way is to have infrastructure as code, have an ephemeral build environment. And so these are things that you um, as an engineer or in your organization can start talking about and, and be able to do something. Um, what I will say, though, is uh, Salsa is not like SOC 2 compliance. There's not an authority that like walks up to you and like make sure you do all these things. It's very much uh, like a self-assessment thing. Um, if I use your software and I see that you are Salsa level three, that gives me an understanding of where you're at in your security journey. Cool. Landscape and tools. Um, so we're going to talk about all the exciting stuff, six door in total, tough. But before we do that, I do feel like we can't talk about securing the supply chain without understanding encryption, which is a really, really big topic. Um, and assuming an understanding of encryption are leaving folks out of the conversation. So I'm gonna do my best to, to teach you quick and dirty road into asymmetric encryption. I haven't even taken the course yet. Um, hopefully this will work. So, if you've ever um, go to a website and see that little padlock there, that means that your uh, connection is secure, uh, it has TLS, which means that the very first handshake was asymmetric encryption. It, they exchange a key and then that keys is you for symmetric encryption. Uh, this is a little different than what we're gonna talk about, which is a digital uh, signature. Uh, for the most part, digital signature has to do with asymmetric encryption. Okay, so, Imagine you are getting um, a binaries uh, from someone. Uh, you are the verifier, they are the signer. You wanna make sure that the thing you got didn't get tampered with. Um, and so what the signer will do is they will take the package, encrypt it with their private key and create a signature. And the signature comes with the package. And so when you go and get this package uh, from the registry, uh, you are also able to obtain a public key from the certificate. And you use this public key to uh, decrypt and get the binary. So, and we're just gonna pretend that hashing doesn't exist. Um, and so the key here is you can encrypt with private key, decrypt with public key. Um, you, it also comes with a certificate. This, that's where you get the, uh, the key from. Certificate is about identity. Um, keys and signature is about authenticity. That's all you need to know for the most part. Cool. Yeah, so you, if you use the public key, decrypt it, and you got the same thing as the package you get, great. Um, so those are the basics into Sixdoor. Um, so Sixdoor is comprised of three main components. The first one is Cosign, uh, which helps you sign and verify software artifacts. 
uh, then you've got Fulcio, which is uh, which provides ephemeral uh, certificates, and then you've got Wrecker, which is a uh, transparency locks. Uh, for the most part, we'll talk about the public instance of Wrecker. Cosine. So we just talked about um, public and private keys, right? So there are really three commands that you need to know about cosine to understand cosine. Um, the first is generate key pair, right? The public and private key we just talked about, cosine can help you verify those. Um, and by the way, cosine is short for container signing. It's, they're, they're more optimized for signing containers, um, but you can also use it to sign other things. So you generate key pair, and then you can sign with your private key. And then if you're getting a package from someone else, you can verify with your public key. And there's more nuance to this, right? If you are running a production system, um, maybe you want to point that to your KMS system to uh, your favorite cloud provider. But on a wider scale, what Cosine really offer uh, and where the magic is, is ephemeral key. So you don't have to uh, create the key or manage your own key when you want to sign. Every time you sign, it creates a key that lasts for about 10 minutes. Fulcio. So, Fulcio is a certificate authority. What does this mean? So, when you buy luxury goods, it usually comes with a certificate that said this thing is authentic. Or the same is also true for like birth certificate, right? It can't just come from anyone. It has to mean something. Um, but Fulcio is specifically good at creating short-lived um, certificate that is optimized for things like cosine. Um, and it's based on email address. So, your identity is based on your email address. Um, and the anatomy of a certificate request is actually pretty simple. Um, you have three things. The first one is your OIDC ID token. Uh, it sounds scary. Actually, it is just like you sign in with Gmail. Uh, if, you've, if you went through Gmail, Gmail will, will give Fulcio a uh, token. And then your public key and a challenge. A challenge sounds a little dramatic. I thought it was like a duel in cyberspace or something. Not really. Um, so because public keys are public, um, you, you need a way to tell Folsio that you actually own them, right? Um, and the way you do that is like imagine Folsio give you like say a string. You in encrypt it with your private key. If Folsio can decrypt it with a public key you gave it and get the same response, then now you own uh, the public key. Wrecker is a time to approve log of metadata from the software supply chain. Um, when I first read this, it didn't mean a whole lot. Uh, basically, when you sign, uh, when, when you own a package and you sign it, that creates a lock in Wrecker on the public instance um, that people can go in and check and look at the certificate and see if the certificate was valid um, when you signed it. Um, and if you like understand the basic of blockchain, it's kind of like that, this is tamper-proof lock. It's not actually based on blockchain, though. Um, there's a great blog I will link at the end uh, for when the folks at uh, Sixdoor discuss the implication of like why they didn't choose blockchain for now. Cool. So we like had these three tools. Let's look at them in um, a more applicable sense. So uh, Kubernetes 1.27 just came out um, and say I want to verify that this package I got from the registry is valid. I know the certificate identity. I know the issuer. I specify these things. Um, and you can see the hash of the body here. And one of the parameter I get back is lock index. What does this mean? So I'm going to get this number right here, go to record, search it up. And what it will tell me is a signature. It will also tell me the certificate and whether or not the certificate was valid um, when this package was signed. We're going to look a little bit under the hood of what Cosine is actually doing here by using a tool named Crane. Um, and don't worry too much about Crane. It's just a tool that we're going to use to interact um, with remote images. Um, and so I'm going to get the digest of this package right here. And then I'm also going to get um, the signature because I know that Kubernetes released the package with the signature. And what that gives me is the hash, which is like the body of, of uh, the package. It also gives me the certificate and the signature. And this is what Cosine is doing behind the scene, right? It has a signature. It's going to get the public key from the certificate, do its decrypting magic, and compare that back to the manifest. Um, Cosine also saves a bunch of metadata in the process. Um, Little side note: If you're if you're looking at the documentation, you're trying to do it at home. Uh, the documentation is a little bit out of date as of Cosine 2.0. Hopefully, we'll get to fixing it soon. Um, because uh, 
Coastliner Six Store right now is really optimized for container registry. Um, other folks in other parts of open source are also interested in, in adopting the same thing. Um, now that security supply chain is really top of mind for the industry. Um, and so Six Store Python has been made and there is a proposal um, to use Six Store in the NPM registry. Cool. Um, next up we have in Toto. Um, and the way I think of Intoto is two part. The first one is uh, the layout, which is policy, what you expect to happen, uh, in what order, by whom. And the second part is the record, the link metadata files that is created as you create your software, right? So I think of it as like a record player, what steps was were performed by whom and in what order. So say when you're making your package, you can type in Intoto record start, do all the things you need to do, interact with it, and then do in total record stop. And behind the scene, in total will record your identity and like the steps that you took along the way. Um, and what that helps you with is that you can verify your attestation by comparing the layout to the link metadata file. So comparing what you expect to happen, by whom, in what order, to what actually happened so that your attestation is actually true. And then tough was, was a tough one for me to, to comprehend, um, but really it's about the last mile of package distribution. Um, so the way the folks uh, behind tough think about this is that it's not a matter of if, but when your package uh, or your key or your repo will be compromised. And so when that happened, what can you do to minimize uh, the impact of that as much as possible? And so the threat model that they came up with is role. So you have the person at the top or a few people at the top who, who are roots and that uh, gives them permission to specify other roles. You have target, which uh, gives you permission to indicate uh, package validity, snapshot, package version, and timestamp is package last updated. So you can imagine it like almost like a triangle uh, if a, the timestamp key got get compromised, you still can't do a whole lot with that. And Tuff really focused on key revocation and like minimize the impact. So if you think back to Intoto, Intoto and Tuff works hand in hand and that Intoto follows you throughout your development process and then Tuff helps you with the very last part. But also uh, the roles that you specify in Tuff is the one that you could also use for Intoto to specify like, oh, Alice is only Alice should only be able to develop, and Bob should only be able to release the package. Things like that. Cool. We're at the very last part of um, the discussion here, and it's about misconception and discussion. And I think misconception is a little bit of a misnomer. What it's more about is things to think about as we dive deeper into the conversation, and now that we have context about the conversation. So. It's just about the code, right? Right? No. Uh, as we see in the, in the case uh, with uh, solar winds, it's about all the stuff that went in before the consumer get the package and to make sure that it's not tampered with. Um, the second misconception is that you might think you're probably not a good target and like, Sure, if you're, if you're not a crypto company, uh, your risk profile might be a little lower or different, but that doesn't mean that you can't be used as a stepping stone in order to get to bigger targets. And then lastly, we can never fully remove supply chain risk in our software. It's really an effort of the, in the entire ecosystem, um, which bring me to this uh, XKCD picture that we've probably all seen before. Um, it's a sure responsibility, right? It's a conversation that we need to have in open source about the fact that open source is often underfunded and uh, maintained by folks who are overworked. And so how do we offer governance and support for them in order to help them get the resources that they need uh, for them to invest in things like salsa and, and supply chain security? Um, so this is an incredibly exciting place to be and a lot of standards are being made as we talk and very much in this conference. Um, so I encourage you to, to go talk to the folks uh, who are maintaining these projects. Um, and um, a lot of the standards are being open for discussion right now, like Salsa. Um, things that I didn't get a chance to touch on that are also important, things like vulnerability scanning, securing your build environment, uh, patching your containers. Um, so there are projects out there, uh, so like 
Walk helps you make the most of your SBOM. Right now, uh, the way most folks are using SBOM is that they like generate it or they like take it and they store it for compliance and audit process. So how do we make the most of what we have and Walk help you graph it to like visualize it? Um, GitHub just announced a new feature where you can click a button and produce an SBOM on your project, which is pretty cool. And then Docker now also have Docker SBOM, which is an experimentation. Now that you have this foundation, you are very, very well equipped to attend all these awesome talks, um, many of whom are by folks who have answered questions and helped me um, make this presentation. So I highly encourage you attend them. Um, and that is it, folks. Um, please hit me up on Twitter if you have questions. Uh, I graduate in a year, and I probably will need a job if you want to hit me up for that as well. Um, the economy's not good. Um, this is my first ever in-person talk, which is really exciting to see a crowd. And so I really encourage you to give me feedbacks. And that is it. Um, we're open for a question. I don't see any. So the question is, uh, in Toto, um, is a recording for the steps that has happened. And so does that mean that it can create uh, provenance? Um, and so provenance in the context of salsa looks like a very specific shape in like a schema that they, they've outlined. Um, so like, I, I don't think that the stuff that is generated by in Toto, which is like linked metadata files, are provenance, but I'm sure you can get there. Oh, okay, correction, that was from Justin, the uh, maintainer of, of Intel One Top, and the answer is yes. Do you have another question? Oh yeah, go for it. Can I speak about the Kubernetes point of view? From a, um, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. If the if the S bomb is included from like Kubernetes uh, binaries releases, we do uh, have manifest and S bombs and signatures and such. But I don't know if you're asking from the perspective of like Kubernetes user. Okay, yeah, so from, if you are an admin of a cluster, um, how do you check your SBOM? And from my understanding so far is that there's not a standard in the industry because SBOM, usually the mo most folks just store it for compliance purposes right now, yeah. But the, the folks at Guac are also working on like making a dependency graphs and stuff like that. All right. Last call, and we're good. Thank you for coming. <laughs>